finish our series today appropriately called Don't Look Back. As we've gone through the book of Hebrews, we're going to cover the last three chapters this morning. We'll be talking about faith, the faith to love, and what active faith means and what it looks like. I had a moment yesterday when we were going through the building and um, we were cleaning up and, and moving some stuff in and putting it in place. And I was walking my wife around showing her some of the changes that have been made. And we went up on the stage and the, the stage is different now. It uh, comes out a little bit further and um, it's just different. And so I stood out there for the first time and I was like, wow, this is weird. I've preached for 24 years in this spot back here and now I'm out here and it's going to feel look a little bit differently. But I was reminded of how God has brought us through this entire process. I was reminded how the week before the fire, a lady came down front and I had just finished preaching a sermon. She said, would it be all right if I uh, told you something that God told me? And I was like, sure. And she says, God gave me a word and it's, I don't know, anyway, I'm just supposed to tell you. And I said, okay. And she said, he said wildfire. He said God's going to move like wildfire. And I said, well, awesome, that's wonderful. We prayed together. Next weekend, the church catches on fire. (laughs) I was like, is that what you meant by wildfire, you know? Um, But I, I, and then I had a guy come up after the fire and say, God just gave me a sense of peace about this, that this, we needed this. And I truly believe by faith that God has brought this about for a reason, for a time of Uh, change for a time of pruning for a time of focus in a life of our community and that truly God has something for us that's even better than we've ever experienced and that we're turning the page and I started thinking about these moments of faith and even this building that we're we're in right now I remember when we raised the money uh, to build this and it was a huge stretch for us as a church and we were all asking to be to to go before God a sacrificial gift and and so Jody and I were praying and God put this number out there it was crazy amount of money for us and and I, I was just like okay and so by faith we said that's how much we're gonna give I sold my truck um, I was driving a like 1984 uh, CRX Honda, you know, that had smoke plumes coming out. But, but, at the, but I sold my truck and we donated the money to, because God placed it on our heart to do that. I'm not telling you, oh, look, poor Pastor Jeff. No, we were fired up that this is what God asked us to do and this is how he asked us to do it. And so by faith, we did that. And now we're in this building built by the sacrificial gifts of people who trusted God by faith. Um, and sure enough, we actually needed this building as a community. That burned, and had we not built this, we would have not had a place to go. And by faith, we responded, and God has honored our faith. And he blesses us in and through our faith. It's impossible to please God apart from faith. I remember when we built the children's building. I remember when we built West Campus about eight years ago. I was standing on a piece of dirt with some elders, and I said, I believe God's called us to plant a church out here. He just placed it on my heart that this is what we're supposed to do. And we were standing where the present Duncan Day... Uh, Dunkin Donuts is and uh, we all prayed and we said yes but not yet then about five years ago we were praying and, and yes and now but where so we started looking and by that time Dunkin Donuts and everybody else had already built out there and so now there's no place to go and Jamie comes into my office one day and she says there's this little L-shaped piece of property it's right on the access road I think it would be a great place unfortunately there's a building there um, but the rest of the property is for sale and I said, well, let's buy the building and the property. And she said, well, the building's not for sale. And I said, well, everything's for sale. <laughs> I mean, and sure enough, we walked in there, and it was uh, the Hooker Construction Offices. I know, unfortunate name for... Uh, <laughs> and we went in, and we said, um, we'd like to buy your building and the property. And they said, okay, let's do that. I mean, they didn't even blink an eye. They were ready. And we got that building, a great deal. We got that property, and now we have a church out there, all because... We stepped out in faith. Here's what I want to challenge you to think of as we go to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11 is known as the hall of faith. It starts off this way. Now in confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Faith is confidence, confidence in what we hope for and assurance or certainty about what we do not see see 
The ancients were commended for this type of faith. And then it goes on, the whole chapter is about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, about Rachel, about Rahab, about David, how they lived by faith. Abraham, God said, Abraham, I want you to go to this place. And he said, I don't even know where that is. He says, go there and I'm going to give you all that land and I'm going to bless you. And so Abraham said, okay, that seems logical. And Abraham, by faith, trusted God, left everything that he knew, went to a place that he'd never been before, and that God promised he was going to receive this land, even though it was inhabited by other people at the time. Abraham, by faith, responded to God. And God said to Abraham, Abraham, even though you're 100 years old, and even though your wife is 100 years old, and she's never had a child, your guys are going to have a child. And Abraham believed God. And it was attributed to him as righteousness. Here's what I want to challenge you to think about. Faith, active faith, is when you trust God for what he has said, not what you want. There's a difference. Faith is not saying, oh God, please, please help me. I really want a color TV and a new Kia in the driveway, and, and a handsome guy to come ask me out, and, and, and I'm just believing you for it, Lord. I, I, I'm believing you. That's not faith. There's a difference between God of the Bible and a genie. Faith is when we believe God based on what he has spoken. He's spoken to us in his word, thou shalt not. And when by faith we say, no, I'm not going to do that because God doesn't want me to do that. God's word seems to indicate that that's sin. And so I'm not going to, even though the world says it's okay, I'm not going to say it's okay because I'm going to live by faith. Faith is what he has spoken in his word, but also what he has spoken to us by way of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit is in contradiction with the word, it's not the Holy Spirit. Let me repeat that real slow. When whatever is inside of you contradicts what God's word has already said, it is not the Holy Spirit. Now, faith is the absolute certainty, the confidence that what God has said is true. And if God tells you, don't, wait, I've got something better for you, then wait. How does God speak by way of the Holy Spirit? He does it through his word. He does it through others. I could be watching a movie sometimes, and all of a sudden, in a secular movie, the Holy Spirit of God will go, bam, and I'll like, okay. I need to forgive, or I need to confess, or I need to go and ask for peace in this situation or I need to go and exhort this person but as the Holy Spirit of God prompts faith is when I respond in obedience it's not simply what I know or believe it is when I step out in obedience that I am exhibiting faith now we started this series off by saying the writer of Hebrews is writing to people who are torn They've started following Jesus, but some of them have fallen back. And now the writer of Hebrews is saying, I don't know for sure that you really ever truly believed in Jesus because of the way you're living. So what he's saying is there are people who have trusted in Jesus and received the Holy Spirit of God who are no longer living like the Holy Spirit of God is in them. And then there are people who are religious but have never received the Holy Spirit of God. And when they look at each other, they look at each other and they're basically the same. So there are people with the Holy Spirit that aren't living by the power of the Holy Spirit. And then there are people who are religious who've never received the Holy Spirit. The worst place in the world to be is to think you're saved and not be. Because you are utterly convinced that you're saved. And the people that have the Holy Spirit but aren't living like it aren't helping you out. Because you're like, I'm no different from them. We both go to church. We both go to life group. They have the Holy Spirit of God and ignore him. And I just keep going to church and going to life group. 
And that's my faith. That's what the writer has been saying all along. And so I'm here to help you to say what he's trying to help us understand is the people that possess the Holy Spirit of God, the life they are called to live is the life of faith. Not the life of go to church, not the life of go to life group, check the box and feel good about yourself. It is the life of responding in faith to what God has said and what God is saying. When's the last time you stepped out and trusted God for what he spoke to you? God told me to start tithing, so I did. God told me to join a life group, so I did. God told me to forgive, so I did. God told me to confess, so I did. God told me to repent and no longer do that anymore, and so I did. God told me to trust him in this situation or in that situation. When's the last time the Holy Spirit of God or the Word of God illuminated and manifested itself in your life and you said, okay, Lord, I will say yes. That's faith. Not what you want, but what God has said. Now, the second thing, faith is a focused endurance. In Hebrews chapter 12, he says, okay, here's the deal. This hall of faith, all the people in chapter 11, he says, therefore, since we are surrounded by the great cloud of witnesses, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Paul, Barnabas, all were surrounded, they're in the stadium, all right, and we're on the field, They ran their race, it's now time for us to run our race. And we are surrounded by the great cloud of witnesses, people who lived by faith, people who lived this way. They heard God and they said yes. We're surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses, witnesses to testify that this life can be lived. And in fact, that this is how we should live. We're surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses, so let us throw off everything, everything that hinders. Now, in the Greek games, um, what they would do is they called, they would gird their loins. Yeah, whatever. Anyway, basically, they wore robes, and they would take it, and they would wrap it around their, race, around their waist so they could run. And so what they'd do is they'd get rid of everything that would slow them down, gird up their loins, and, and get ready for the race. Here's what he's saying. Throw off everything that hinders you, everything that encumbers you, everything that that distracts you we're distracted a lot you cannot run your race and have multiple focuses it's impossible we deceive ourselves by thinking that we can multitask you really can't you just think you can but you're not multitasking you're doing either one thing really well or many things badly focus is the art of elimination Focus is the art of elimination, and it is lost in our culture because we can put our makeup on, text, and drive. I watched a lady do it this week. I thought she was drunk. But no, she was multitasking. No, she was doing three things very badly. Focus is the art of elimination. If you are going to run your race and live a life of faith, you must eliminate things that distract you. You must eliminate things that impede your ability to trust Jesus. You're trusting yourself. You're trusting your 401K. You're trusting your pocketbook. You're trusting, uh, you know, some computer program. And the Holy Spirit of God is saying, no, you need to listen to me. So you must quiet all the other voices because focus is the art of elimination. What do you need to remove in order to run your race? It happens all the time. We do it in our, our marriages. What happens is we focus on the kids, where God has says, no, focus on your marriage. Your kids will be fine. But we put our kids first. And then the marriage starts to suffer. Hey, it's not about your kids. It's about your marriage. Those little rascals are going to grow up and break your heart and leave. And then you're going to be stuck with this person that you don't know anymore because you spent all your time driving them around to all the stupid stuff that they want to do. And you let your marriage fall apart. Newsflash. God's word says you are in a covenantal relationship and it should be a priority. 
You put your work above worship. Work becomes your worship. I don't have time to do that. I gotta go, I gotta work. I'm sorry, I have a job. I wish I could get paid to preach one day a week, but I can't, I've got real stuff to do. The reality is we worship our work. You can only have one focus. Fitness or faith? Pastor Jeff, I don't have time to have a quiet time because I have a gym membership. <laughs> they have time to go work out four or five days a week, but they don't have time for a Bible study. They don't have time for a life group. They don't have time to serve because they are worshiping somewhere else. <laughs> Money or generosity? The scripture is very clear about the difference between money and generosity. You can't have two focus. Foci. <laughs> so then he goes on to say this. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus. Okay, so he finishes off by saying, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin, the sin that so easily entangles and so fix our eyes on Jesus. The sin that so easily entangles. Did you know you have a sin with your name on it? Most people don't. Most people don't live an introspective enough life to know that they have a sin that's theirs. There's a sin with your name name on it and you don't know what it is most of the time you think you do but really what you're focused on is fruit and not root well I struggle with pornography pastor Jeff and I've been struggling with it for years and I do good for a while and then I don't and I click on it again and I, and I struggle with it no you don't that's fruit that's a manifestation of your sin but there's a root to that sin What is the root? Why do you end up? C.K. Chesterton said, every man who knocks on the door of a whorehouse is really knocking on the heart of God. There's a longing in our souls to be, to be respected, to be appreciated, to be loved, to be nurtured, to be cared for. And so the man who's seeking relief over here by, by fantasizing and whatever, he's the that's the fruit, but there's a deeper root that he's totally missing and ignored. The person who's verbally critical and mean-spirited with their tongue, they try to cover it up. Well, let's just pray for Susie, would you? We really need to pray for her because she's a mean, vindictive, crazy woman who's manipulative and it's hateful, and I don't like her. But let's, well, let's just pray for her. Would you join me as we pray for her? And y'all cover it up a lot of different ways, but at the end of the day, what is that? Well, you could call it malicious gossip. You could call it uh, mean-spirited bitterness. What's the root of it? That's the fruit. What's the root? Is it insecurity? Is it self-righteous pride? You've got to stop and identify the sin with your name on it. Lots of people running around here, and well, I'm just trying to be smart and wise and check all the boxes and do no you're trying to control you're trying to henpeck someone into doing what you want them to do the way you want them to do it because you are insecure and afraid and you can mask it all the way but it's sin and the root of it is you are insecure and absolutely don't believe that God's in control and trust and yet we go on with our masquerade, and I'm not talking about anyone. I'm just talking about generalities over here. So if that's you, I'm not, I didn't read your mail. <laughs> but what we have to do is we have to identify the sin, the one that entangles us. If you are going to run your race, the life of faith, then you have to identify the sin that easily, easily trips you up. Because if you don't identify it, and start focusing on Jesus and eliminate the things that hinder you, you will never live the life of faith because you're always going to be hamstrung by the sin that you've never even identified. It's like walking through a, a dark room and, and, and someone's throwing punches. You don't even know where it's coming from. 
You just find yourself on the ground going, what? Because you've never identified the sin. Focus is the art of elimination. You've got to keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. He's the one that designed the race course. He ran the race course, and he finished the race course. He knows where every obstacle, he knows where every uh, water pit, he knows where every high jump is, he knows whatever analogy you want to use. He ran it, he ran it with perfection because he designed the course and he finished the course. And so what he's saying is, if you're going to run this race, keep your eyes on me. Keep your eyes on me. I ran it, I created it, I finished it. Don't take your eyes off of me. And if I jump, you jump. And if I weave, you weave. And if I bob, you bob. If I zigzag, whatever, you know the analogy. You follow Jesus. That's the life of faith. And so when the Holy Spirit of God says confess, then confess. And when the Holy Spirit of God says surrender, then surrender. When the Holy Spirit of God says fast, then fast. When he says says, give, then give. When he says end this relationship, end it. When he says set boundaries, set boundaries. That's the life of faith. Faith is not trying to get God to do what you want him to do. You can pray all day long for your agenda. That's a genie. What you need to do is pray that God would speak and give you the courage and the willingness to obey. The final thing is this. Enduring faith loves He says, keep on loving one another in Hebrews 13. Remember those in prison. Remember those who are mistreated, who are suffering. Before that, in Hebrews 12, he says, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. The New International Version says that worship is our acceptable service, our acceptable service to God. Our worship to God is serving and loving, meeting those who are suffering, meeting those who are needy, meeting those who are imprisoned. And so today when we talk about Hurricane Harvey, when we talk about the world around us, at the end of the day, faith is active because the Holy Spirit is working and he is moving. He's working, he is moving, and he's moving us to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Not to just go to church and not to just go to Bible study and fill out a check and go home for somebody else to do. No, he's working and moving. And if it's not the people of God who are responding out of compassion and grace to the Holy Spirit's movement, what good are we? There are lost people that have more compassion for the people in Houston than the people of God. What's wrong with that picture? Is it because we haven't heard? Okay, maybe. And if we haven't heard, is it because God's not speaking? Or is it because we're not listening? We're worried about the gas line out, outside more than we're worried about the person who doesn't have a roof over their head or a meal to eat. So the question is, Lord Jesus, speak. But there's a bigger problem because there's some people in this room that don't have the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit of God in them and they think they're saved and they can't remember the Holy Spirit of God ever telling them, speaking to their heart. Scripture says if you are a child of God, the Spirit of God will testify to your spirit that you're a child of God. You may have grown up religious, but if you don't have the indwelling presence of God speaking to you and guiding you, you're in a really difficult place. Others of you know the Holy Spirit of God. He's lived inside of you for a long time. He's spoken in times past. But somewhere along the way, you grieved and quenched the Holy Spirit. You just said no. No. I'm gonna do my thing. And you're checking the box now. You go to church. Your faith is not an active faith of relying on what God has said. Your faith is a passive faith of a general knowledge and belief. As long as everything's going all right in your world, then you go to church, you check the box, you do the thing, and you're a good person. But you can't remember the last time you responded in faith to what the Holy Spirit asked you to do. You're not even running the race, you're on the sideline. Because the ones who run the race cast off what has entangled them. 
They identify what's going to trip them up. They set their eyes on Jesus and they run with endurance. And when the Holy Spirit of God says, they say yes. And that's the adventure. That's the adventure of faith. I've taught my kids, my little girl, she was having major spinal surgery. And she wanted to have the surgery and we were, not, we were torn. If she didn't have the surgery, she'd end up being a hunchback. But if she did have the surgery, it, she would risk her life. Possibility of not walking again, possibility of dying. She came to me and she said, Daddy, I prayed about it. And I know that the Holy Spirit of God has told me I'm supposed to have this surgery. I said, well, he didn't tell me. <laughs> and then I thought about it a little while and I said, I trust you. I believe that you walk with the Lord and so we're going to do it. Now, years later, she's able to minister and comfort people who are on the doorstep of having to make those same decisions. But at 16, she knew the voice of the Lord. She knows how to walk with God. The question is, are we continuing to walk and run the race? Some of you are here today and you don't know for sure that the Lord Jesus lives inside of you. We've all been there. At some point, we had to come to terms with saying, I don't think the Holy Spirit lives in me. You can reconcile that today. Matter of fact, if you're here and, and you would say, I don't know for sure that I've ever heard the Holy Spirit speak to me. Do you lift up your hand? Okay. Anybody over here? Over here? Back here. If someone near you raised their hand, before we leave today, I want you to pause and stop with them and pray for them. Pray for them. You know what to do. You know what to do. Would you have the courage and the faith to do it? And then others of you, it's been a long time. You've either grieved or quenched the Holy Spirit by rebellion, unwillingness, unfaithfulness, stubbornness, pride, worldly philosophy that you've chosen to live in the deception because it fits your narrative better than what scripture has to say. When's the last time the Holy Spirit spoke and you responded in faith? I'm gonna ask Caleb to come and close us out. I'm gonna sing this song together good, good father. He is a good, good father. No matter where you are, what you've done, he loves you. He will always receive you and accept you. But the life of faith can only be lived by people who are saying yes to the father. You can have a relationship with God that's distant because you're simply choosing to live the way that he never designed you to live. You'd rather have your way than his that's not faith. Who's in charge? Who's the authority of your life? Faith is when we can't see the outcome. We don't even necessarily like it. We don't even necessarily understand it. But we say yes because he said so. That's faith. And it's scary business. And if you haven't been scared lately or stretched out of your comfort zone, chances are you're not living by faith. It's impossible to please the Father apart from faith. You guys stand. Let's sing together. Love so undeniable I, I can hardly speak Unexplainable, I, I can hardly think as you call, deeper still as you Bye.
by the grace of his son and he calls us to worship him and so that's what we do every week if you're here today and you need prayer our prayer team here is right up front and we'd love to pray with you we'd love to intercede with you as the body of Christ but for now if you're on your way out we're excited for next week amen we're excited to see you here to continue worshiping in the next chapter of what God has for Grace Point thank you for joining us this morning you are dismissed